Hello everybody, my name is Diana Andone. I'm the director of the e-learning center in the Polytechnica University of Timshara. And I'm the host for the open lecture series webinars, which are run part of the European uh, Universities Alliance UDRES and also the project which is uh, managing this, which is the ICE project. If you will allow me, I will start first with an introduction of the project as uh, that's, uh, that's, um, th that's the procedure which we are following in all of this. So ICE is the UDRES Entrepreneurship and Innovation Network for Smart and Sustainable European Region is funded by the European Union through the European Institute of Innovation and Technologies. And these open lecture series are a series of lectures, which are trying in fact to empower the educators and the innovators through a community which is going to develop world-class solutions to challenges and to the growth and the scale jobs, which we all want in our society. European Institute for Innovation and uh, Technology has nine projects and nine pro programs in which these are part of. We are part of the AET raw materials. So we are really uh, trying to encourage all of these uh, partnerships in all the areas. We are mainly focusing on developing major strengths for, for Europe. As I said, AINS is part of the UDRES uh, European Universities Alliance from which uh, several universities are uh, in the consortium is led by the Fachhochschule St. Walton from where we have one of the speakers today. And then uh, the partners are Polytechnical University of Setubal from Portugal, the Hungarian University of Agriculture and Life Sciences from Hungary, the University College from Leuven Limburg uh, from Belgium, us, the Polytechnical University of Timișoara from Romania, VZMS uh, University of Applied Sciences from Latvia, and a very large association, which is the University Industry Innovation Network. We are mainly looking in the ICE project on how to empower and support the entre innovators, which for us are the entrepreneurship and innovators who are planning to bridge the gaps in the knowledge triangle. The knowledge triangle being, being the knowledge between academic teaching and learning and the research and the community and the area between us, the region between us. We are all thinking about how to encourage our education to become more learner driven and how to encourage innovation by in the same time trying to provide the expertise and the resources for a smart and sustainable European regions, the regions in which our universities are located. The open lecture series are eight open lecture series. This is open lecture number five. They are all online and accessible lectures provided by the project expert. And they are planning more or less to enhance the entrepreneurial and innovation education, as I said, and it's run in a specific format. You can ask question and answer in the Q&A here in Zoom. There are going to be some activities and reflection in Menti, which is going to be commented by our experts. At the end of the Zoom meeting, we are going to have a quiz, which is a test for everybody who is part of it. If you answer positively to that test, then you will receive the open badge. The open badges are stackable, so you will be able to receive from each of them a different badge, and only those who are going to uh, finalize successfully with the test and participate in all the open lectures are going to receive also a certificate. This time, we are going to have a very interesting open lecture dedicated to digital media with colleagues from Austria and colleagues from Latvia. And it's my great pleasure now to uh, introduce my colleague. I just want to bring him also uh, live here next to me, uh, who is uh, Professor Do Jakob Doppler, um, coming from Fachhochschule St. Paulton, the University of Applied Sciences from St. Paulton, Austria. He's the academic director of the digital healthcare and the head of the Center for Digital Health and Social Innovation. Is part of the Department of Media and Digital Technologies. And he was doing a lot of projects and a lot of work in the area of digital healthcare, the digital design, but also in digital media production and in interactive technologies. 
I need to say for very many, for many, many years, we are working with University of St. Paul since we 2000, in fact, so they are more than 17 years now. Us here in the Polytechnic University of Timshara, we are running several specialization in the same topics of digital technologies and digital media technologies. So this promises to be a very interesting uh, presentation. So Jacob is going to speak about how digital media and technologies revolutionize the healthcare and why education plays such a significant role. Jacob, the floor is yours. So I unmuted my microphone. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. Thank you so much for having me here at the Ains Open Lecture Series. And thank you, Diana, for, for hosting this session. Uh, my name is Jacob Doppler, and I'm the program manager again of a, a master program in Digital Austria called Digital Healthcare. Um, and I want to explain um, a little bit about our philosophy, why we bring students from healthcare and technologies together into one master program. And uh, additionally, I want to explain what um, uh, education and, uh, has to do with research in the, in the field of digital healthcare and social innovation and why it is really, really important to have this uh, interdisciplinary approach towards it. And I, I'm happy to share uh, our experiences. Uh, and uh, we are in such a broad European uh, connection over EINS and, and this Eucharist program. Uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to, to have uh, people from all over Europe here. Uh, we, we just currently had um, uh, visiting uh, Meet the Researchers event in St. Pölten, where I think four or five different nationalities came. I, I just hired, and I think this is interesting because so many people from uh, Romania and, and uh, specifically Timisora are here. Um, I just we just hired uh, a junior researcher from uh, Romania. Uh, it's, I think it was uh, technically University of Bucharest who is super happy to work with us in, in Austria. And we, we have him also in the field of digital healthcare. Uh, so if you need to or want to reach out to me anytime, please, please do so. And I'm happy to um, discuss further afterwards. But now I, I switch over to my slides and I hope that you can see my slides right now. Give me a second. Um, should be visible, right? Is OK? Yes, correct. Yes, perfect. Thank OK, you. so then, then I start um, with my talk um, one more time called How Digital Media and Technologies Revolutionize Healthcare and why education plays a significant role in there. Okay, so um, let me start first off um, with explaining a little bit what, what our master does. So, so um, we had like almost 10 years ago now the idea to bring together people from, uh, from healthcare. So, so students who had have their bachelor's in any field of healthcare, any applied field, this could be physiotherapy, could be occupational therapy, uh, could be um, uh, nutrition uh, or, or health um, um, sciences, could be advanced nursing practice uh, uh, and so on and so forth, radio technologists. So all these people from healthcare are in a dire need and, and want to further develop themselves towards, um, towards the field of uh, um, digital technologies. Uh, I would say. And on the other hand, we have people, some people, um, specifically like, like me and colleagues of mine, who actually um, study technologies, but they want to have an impact with their work in technologies uh, that brings immediate or um, middle term uh, effects to people. So this is, I think, the main motivation that we see with our students. So people who say, yeah, I know that the technologies are here, I know what they can do, but I want to bring benefit to people. And we bring these two people together in order to um, um, develop assistive technologies, um, think about digital community care, think about well-being, and do this in, in certain kind of fields with technological drivers also. So meaning uh, we have uh, health collaborations of humans with machines uh, in the future. We have augmenting data-rich environments. We have mobile sensing and feedback modalities. And all of these things we try to um, prototype, test, evaluate, conceptualize in, in our master program. Um, and I think it is really important before we actually deep dive into, um, into some um, use cases about this to talk about what is digital healthcare actually. So um, to me, this is not the uh, technologies in healthcare is not something completely new, right? So um, when looking at Wikipedia, which my students are not allowed, I found this very good sentence, which disappeared a few years ago. So it's, it's a few years old, but I still like it. It says digital healthcare concerns the use of information and communication technologies 
to help address the health challenges and problems faced by patients. Uh, and I added the health or healthcare stuff. Um, so there are three very good terms in there that I like a lot. And the one is the term challenge, change challenges in healthcare. And we all know these challenges, right? So every one of us sees it, feels it. Uh, if you talk to people from healthcare, you, you might get more insight into this. Uh, we have a huge demographic change and shift uh, going throughout Europe and all the developed countries, you could say. So people are getting older, or as others might say, we, we don't have enough young people, whatever this means. So, And of course, this changes a lot when it comes to the uh, sheer number of cases uh, that happen to be uh, in healthcare. This changes everything when it comes to having doctors, general practitioners in rural areas uh, where you have more cases than doctors and, and they disappear because the work there is so hard. Um, and you, you're missing a lot of uh, nurses and, and caring persons throughout whole Europe, which uh, puts everyone under pressure. And in the same time, uh, we, we, every one of us wants the same quality of treatment uh, while this increasing cost pressure is, is rising up, right? So this is uh, quite known. I didn't specifically stress here things like COVID pandemic or uh, mental diseases on the rise, uh, myopia, short-sightedness. All of these things are like kind of side waves to this to these huge waves that are coming in this direction. And on the other hand, we have this information and communication technologies that are available now. We have high availability of them. They come at low cost. Uh, I mean, think just of... Um, of sensor technologies and what you can all do with uh, miniaturized um, computing platforms that are not, no no uh, uh, no larger than a coin right now, where you have Bluetooth, you have wireless LAN, you have uh, the sensing modalities, and you can drive a web server on this size or even virtualized somewhere in the cloud, right? So there's a lot of things actually happening outside. And the question is, can we somehow use this in order to improve healthcare? Um, and even uh, the European Union, for example, in the eHealth Action Plan, which is quite some years old, says that ICT, um, uh, information and communication technologies, uh, becomes increasingly important uh, to deliver top quality care to European citizens. So everyone is acknowledging this. And um, the third thing that actually is in this sentence is the sentence uh, that says faced by patients, faced by healthcare staff, faced by relatives. So we have a user-centered design imminently integrated in here. So we want to provide solutions for patients, for healthcare staff, for relatives, for people in your healthcare environment, and not for uh, business cases in the in the primary goal, not for um, um, making processes uh, better um, uh, between uh, for data exchange. Not not actually in the first place. Also not strengthening. Uh, where data is stored or what kind of security issues are they? These, these are all really, really important, especially when it comes to healthcare. But um, before this, we need to have use cases for people and we need to have improvement of their daily work and their daily life. This is what we really want to achieve with digital healthcare, if you ask me. And this is not based on, on uh, just our assumptions. So if you look, for example, at the very uh, wonderful topple review, which uh, was done in February 2019 by the NHS, uh, so the the healthcare system in um, the UK, they also state based on uh, quite a lot of research that within 20 years, 90% of all healthcare jobs in the NHS, no matter if you are just a, a, a nurse, a doctor, or if you are a healthcare provider in a rural environment, you will have the need for digital literacy. If you don't have this ability to navigate in data-rich environments, you're basically to some extent lost in your job. Yeah, and. This also comes with um, with new chances um, for universities, I would say, or for for also the fields of, of healthcare. So we need cross disciplinary approaches in healthcare, and this does not mean that nurses and doctors should talk more to each other, but this means that computer scientists, engineers, uh, bioinformaticians uh, need to talk and and find a common basis together with pharmacists, with therapists, with doctors, even with patients and users. So we need to have cross-disciplinary approach as a DNA for this future of the healthcare system, definitely. And um, question here is then, what are the needs in healthcare anyway? So um, when when you look at it from a, from a computer science perspective, you could say, okay, we, we, we sense data, we process data, and we reinteract data. Yeah? I, I put this specifically at the bottom of the slide because I dearly believe that the human needs in healthcare are 
much more important. So they should be at the top. So first formulate what your needs are, and then maybe there is a technology that somehow enhances, improves whatever you process you need or whatever kind of treatment you need. Uh, not necessarily alone. Yeah, we won't uh, have the, the care robot driving around the next ten years, uh, but maybe in 20, 30 years. And the question is, what is he, she, it uh, allowed to do? Uh, and uh, how do we interact with these kind of uh, robots and digital artifacts? And if you look at healthcare, also specifically, I believe that healthcare is not only the healthcare system per se, but we have um, working conditions, we have living conditions, we have communications conditions and needs mobility conditions and healthcare uh, also split up between health and cares. These are two words um, where you can play around. So also the social aspect of, of healthcare is really, really important when it comes to it. So, and that I think that we need solutions that actually take these two things. So human computer interaction and um, uh, human needs together. That's why I also didn't write ICT or technologies. I wrote human computer interaction. We need to have uh, computers interacting with us and bringing us a benefit in whatever kind of need we have in healthcare. Yeah? And these healthcare are not, um, not uh, singularly, but they are mapped with each other. Think of If you think of mobility, for example, you could think of elderly people who are not able to drive anymore. They cannot reach a doctor. So is there a telecare solution? Or is there in the future self-driving car that brings you to the doctor? Or is the doctor coming with a mobile um, health station to, to your home because the car is driving by itself? Do you know? All of these ideas are actually somehow at the start of moving uh, our society as a whole and, and making a big shift. And if you look at the digital healthcare system, um, people on the outside, they often think, okay, this is inpatient care, right? You were going to hospital and there is healthcare happening. Uh, but of course we have also outpatient care. We have um, the ability to, to go just for one day to a hospital, uh, to an ambulance uh, or to get treatment on the outside of the hospital. Um, then we have this primary healthcare achievements, um, at least in Austria, they're on the rise. So bringing smaller units to rural areas where there is no doctors anymore is really a big thing. <clears throat> but what I personally find interesting is that when you think of healthcare cases and what kind of cases, what kind of needs people have, then we often forget about uh, laypersons and informal care. So things where healthcare happens at home, right? This is the mother or the father who um, uh, checks maybe non-evidence-based if the children are going to school the next day because there is COVID or they have fever um, or um, if someone is actually assessing his own health status without having a, a quality check in total. yeah, And still these questions exist and people really tend towards using all the sources that they have available. So that means um, we see at the brink of healthcare, we see um, a lot of um, fitness and well-being applications uh, running toward the people without any uh, evidence in, 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 in a medical or healthcare perspective, like uh, nutrition, like uh, stay health and fitness with CrossFit and free athletics and whatever this is. But basically, no one is doing a check with you if, if these uh, exercises are good for your health anyway, uh, if you can do this, if you, this is your, your level of performance that you need to meet, right? So there is the biggest chance actually to innovate, if you ask me, in, in healthcare per se. Now, allow me a, a really quick look at, at digitalization. I mean, um, uh, those of you who are from, from uh, digitalists, uh, who are from tech somehow, please excuse this slide, but I still find it interesting. So digitalization is not something that is new. It's somehow bound to communication. This is happening since the Stone Age, right? So we copy things, we remote transmit things. At some point, we, we found out that this is happening. We had bidirectional communication, uh, radio signals sending around. We do this in real time and uh, we have now multi-modalities in multimedia. So doing a computer-based surgery from New York to uh, Vienna is now something that is not within reach, but it's been done actually basically by experts. Um, and this is really the huge shift that I think why the healthcare sector is, is um, innovating a little bit slower um, than, than other branches. And the, there's some people always questioning, is this really happening in healthcare, right? We need treatment, we need wound management, we need uh, to take care of elderly people. We don't need any digitalization there. But I, I always still like this slide and I show them to my students because disruption is happening so quickly. For example, if you just look at these four examples that we have here, we have uh, the biggest taxi company which owns no own vehicles, Uber. We have the biggest comp 
company that produces content, uh, media news content, Facebook or whatever kind of company you place there, um, that have no own content. They don't produce any content. They just dis distribute it. We have Alibaba, Amazon as the most valuable retailers without any inventory um, or no store at least. Yeah? And Airbnb, the biggest accommodation provider without no real estate. Uh, and the, the, the things go on there. So there is a huge shift already ongoing in, in, in other branches. And this will definitely swap over and is already swapping over to healthcare. And the decision that we as a society or as a European society have to make is, do we all leave this to private companies and, and uh, to, to big stakeholders that have, of course, maybe revenue goals behind their minds, or do we want to strengthen our public health services that we already have and also allow this kind of innovation to happen in a kind of a managed and, and uh, uh, supervised um, uh, setting and scenario. This is what, what I would envision uh, going in this direction. And um, yeah, just to give you a few examples, I, I brought now three examples um, to, um, to show actually what, how you can actually combine these needs of healthcare with um, computer interaction technologies. And um, I need to rush a little bit through these, but if you have any questions, please ask later on. Um, so for example, we, we, we asked elderly people we invited, we had a research project inviting 20 um, seniors to our university and asked them, what do elderly people without any media literacy actually need in the internet or in the online worlds? What do you want to have? And we imagined something like they want to have a care robot or they want to have a the smart home control that controls the shutters or makes a coffee in the morning, all these cool scenarios, right? But if you are living at home um, and you wanna stay healthy and you wanna stay fit in your own environment, you don't need someone who's automatically turning your light on or off, right? This is not your main concern. Your main concern is actually getting uh, entertainment, getting information and communicating to people. And this is not much different than from any other target group, if you consider this like this. So what we basically did is um, we, we developed with them prototypes of user interfaces and uh, these lo-fi lo prototypes we developed into high level interfaces and we made kind of a, a platform where they could uh, interact uh, with each other, play card games, uh, which is popular in Austria, and also have video communication, uh, uh, by the way. So, so this is a small box that you connect to your TV and you have a tablet that basically uh, is a kind of a control center for the visualization of your TV. And then we have something um, that actually gives them the chance to communicate to someone else without IP addresses, without two-factor authentication, without uh, IBAN uh, codes without whatever is necessary, all these perks that we have to accept and somehow accept in our, in our, in our technical world, right? So we need simpler interfaces. This is the message that I want to spread here. Um, and um, unfortunately, I cannot show, show this video too much, maybe just uh, skipping through a little bit, but the people, they really liked um, uh, what they saw. They, they did these field tests uh, at our universities, um, trying this out. Um, the funny comments after this were really that they they said one said yeah this is even uh, accessible to me in my young age some some uh, <laughs> some senior with 80 years old who never used a tablet before said at the end and she said this would be wonderful if you are isolated at home in the winter for example and you have no chance to go somewhere then at least have online communication yeah so this would be one very good example and this is also healthcare also it comes from the social care perspective um, okay, and so on. And besides this, of course, you can harvest all the data that is captured in these platforms, and then you can ask questions yourself. So if someone is playing a lot in this uh, uh, in this platform, so using it a lot, and if you have a sharp drop, what is happening here? So is this because the person is on holiday, or is it because of social deterioration? So a lot of questions can be asked afterwards. And the goal here, of course, would be to to bring more services to these platforms because we saw that. Communication and interaction is really the gate opener towards um, towards doing services like teletraining, like open government initiatives, regional and local business initiatives, and so on and so on. So this would be a really good example in this kind of setting. Um, uh, Adriana, could you maybe give me like in the chat uh, a small hint towards the time, how much time I have left? I think it must be 10 minutes or something, or maybe seven. <laughs> 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, Ten. thanks. Very good. Um, that still mean I, I have it in my my I have it in the blood how many minutes I need it. Okay, so second example is uh, gate training and inspection. This is a physiotherapeutical uh, setting, so we want to 
capture the need of gate training and inspection and, and target it with technologies that are called big data, machine learning, and real-time sensing and feedback. What can you do there? Um, in the visual gate inspection works like this. We have a physiotherapist, we have a patient, and they go together and the patient is actually doing a, a walking training from, from A to B and back and the physiotherapist is assessing the gate usually manually with a, with a form where, where he or she enters the data. And then afterwards you try to, to th uh, think about what is, what is the problem here? Is it uh, the knee or the hip or is it some, something else? Is like the, the force not strong enough, especially in rehabilitation, this plays a huge role. But we saw, what we saw was that when, when asking 10 different gate experts on the same patient data, we got almost 10 different kinds of opinions toward what, what the, the, the problem is in specific and what kind of treatment would be the best way. So this is not really very evidence-based. And on the other hand, you have this really gold standard force sensor and, and uh, um, sensor plates that give you exact measurements on the gate of the human uh, walk cycle. But of course, you cannot do this everywhere because this requires, um, uh, yeah, like tens of thousands of euro to getting these plates, and these are only available in some very small stations. So, solutions in the in the end would be to to develop insoles where you actually measure this in real time, uh, transmit it, visualize it, and one modality that we brought in there was sonification. So, sonification means that the data that you capture live, you are, do not visualize in curves, but you basically use them to make sound out of, out of it, yeah? And then you can imagine what happens when you actually uh, have the initial contact and you have the uh, roll and then you have the toe off phase. So this is the gate cycle of the human foot. Um, you, you can imagine that something like And um, this of course sounds silly in the first place, but when you think of it, then you can make for people who are in rehabilitation, they have uh, crouches uh, and you actually have to, um, to walk only with 20 kilograms on the right foot for the first week and then the second week 30 kilogram and then you go to the full of uh, uh, weight of your body that you actually can say look uh, listen to the tone and this, when the tone changes or when there's an error tone then you basically uh, uh, should actually put more pressure on your foot so so you have some modality that gives the patient immediate feedback without having to uh, actually only look at the screen or something like this, which of course we, we do not want in the future. Yeah? This is the one benefit for the patient. The second benefit is actually for the clinic clinician, for, for, the, for the gate expert. So they see these patterns of the, um, of the forces um, on the plate or on the, on the sensor insoles. They see them every day. They exactly know this, for example, is an, uh, uh, a hip patient or a knee patient, and we need to do this kind of treatment in order to make... Uh, make this better after a surgery or procedure. Um, but the funny thing is, of course, that nowadays, if you have a lot, a lot of these samples, you can also make a machine train these things via neural networks and stuff like this. And there's a huge bunch of projects actually going on at our university where we actually try to automate at least some extent uh, the, um, um, the evidence behind actually this data that is in there. And of course, this in the end, the clinician still has to make the decision, but um, if he has some valuable indicators or feedback or uh, like links to other patients which were similar, then this, of course, helps a lot. And eventually, where is this leading? I mean, in the future, we have 3D printed shoes, maybe with sensors integrated that will tell us immediately and continuously what our health feedback is. So I see a lot of people running around with these health watches. Uh, telling them actually uh, how they can improve their health. So maybe this is the next stage to weave this into our clothing, have it in the in the contact lenses or glasses and so on. So this will happen, I'm pretty, pretty sure. And the last kind of um, uh, idea that of course is also evident, um, I think you also pursue similar goals is virtual reality, technology, virtual reality, bringing it to tele brain, uh, training and presence. So what can you do there, of course? Um, you can visualize, for example, for nursing and anot anatomy training, uh, you can visualize um, things. Um, you can actually make parameters appear in 3D. And um, one example that I like very much is a, a student of mine um, did an application for patient information. So usually when you go to a hospital, you have a surgery incoming, then you get this consent form, like seven pages in maybe a foreign language written uh, that doesn't say anything. And the, the foreign language might be even medical speak. Uh, you have no idea what is specifically happening to you right now. Um, but if you see that in radiology and radiotherapy, this specifically will happen to you. You can watch it through three gases 
uh, you can make it available and explain also the noise situation that is in there. And this is a very loud noise, but don't be afraid. And this actually takes away the, the, uh, the frustration maybe that patients feel when they actually undergo surgery and, stuff and, and reduce the stress a lot, right? So this is a, just initial examples of what can be done there. So what is the setting for innovation? Um, if you look at three years of digital healthcare, um, this is my degree program, um, then we have a lot of different kind of professions in there. Usually we, some people thought this can never happen because there's so many things to clarify. People don't speak a common language, but that's exactly what we do. We, within two years of the master's, people establish a common language and then learn from each other. And they are a super, super valuable kind of interface between really, really technical people and really, really healthcare advanced people. So these are the, we need the glue in the middle that helps translating in uh, demands, specifications and so on. And this is where we're really successful in this. The second thing actually is that we need events. Sorry, we need events like the build well-being. So we have a uh, um, a yearly event that is called Build Wellbeing that we share on the one hand is in presence in St. Burton, so super happy to come on the June 16th, 2023. Um, but we also share this online over YouTube and LinkedIn. So if under this link in, in two months, there will be a registration available, we are super happy, happy to, to have people from Europe listening to this YouTube and LinkedIn uh, event and listening to the CEO, for example, of, of a AI-driven health company that does uh, just got a 7 million euro venture capital funding for making interfaces uh, for AI uh, algorithms in healthcare. Or uh, we have like Tanja Stamm, the head of the outcomes research and, and um, the big EU observatory project, H2O, it's called Health2 uh, Outcome Observatory. This is a 20 million EU project where the try to make uh, patient reported outcomes better and, and uh, formulate actually an idea about how this should be described um, uh, throughout countries where you have like 20 hospitals involved and stuff like this. And we need this kind of events where people meet up, discuss ideas, share their visions and tell us how the future of healthcare actually will work. We need also uh, the private partners actually in there, not only hospital providers or like state healthcare uh, politicians and, and, and uh, stakeholders. Yeah, the third thing that you need is an innovative program. Um, so we, we, we have this kind of innovative program where we let uh, students relatively free in three semester ideate, uh, come up with an idea, then we smash it to pieces, um, uh, rebuild these ideas. Uh, we make them do prototypes with technological um, advances like AR, VR, um, artificial intelligence, but also mobile computing and stuff like this. And then we evaluate these kind of projects and they formulate their master thesis in there. And this is, uh, at least to our extent, pretty successful because we some of these, the best uh, ideas of this are actually getting uh, publicated um, uh, together with the lecturers that we have. Um, we have platforms where we actually share these ideas online, like our digital healthcare students show, really, you can find this online. Um, uh, we, we, we do prototypes that we test with kids in school uh, for, I don't know, uh, anatomy training and so on and so on. So there's a lot of things actually going there. And my final word here, and then I'm, I'm done and hopefully didn't uh, overstretch your time, is that I believe that in order to, to innovate, you need to uh, get your hands dirty. So what we did, for example, when uh, physical presence uh, um, um, events were not possible was that... Uh, we just learned how to do streaming uh, over YouTube and how to uh, bring all these things together. So um, we, we, we actually, what you see here is we built this build well-being. So a conference that we, we had each year uh, with about 100 participants in presence, uh, we, 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 we just said, okay, we do it online and the people can listen online. We had around 100 people uh, participating online for almost two and a half hours. So this is really something that, that I, I personally like the most that the people stayed all in there. So no one dropped out for these two hours and then people actually uh, went and, and they, they enjoyed the full event online, which is not self-evident if you know uh, how, how your people nowadays intend online event. They maybe do it on the side and then just close it and leave off. But it, this means that um, people are interested in digital healthcare and uh, um, they want to get this information uh, specifically when it is offered to them for free, of course. <laughs> So um, with this, actually, um, uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I hope this was interesting to you. Please contact me in a, any time you want uh, if you have any further questions. And I'm still here. So happy to answer your question. And thank you uh, for having this talk.
Thank you very much, uh, Jacob. It's really my pleasure to, to have you uh, with us. I was just trying to see if we have any question in the Q&A or in the chat. Just a lot of uh, praise. Uh, quite a lot of people enjoyed your talk and your presentation. So I will have a question for you if, uh, if I'm allowed to. And my question will be more, how important do you think is the digital education, I mean, the digital part of the education for the healthcare professionals, because uh, this is something which is a bridge between two very different professions, if I can say that, and uh, the education probably is uh, becoming <laughs> even more challenging to really yeah, prepare yeah, the yeah. new digital healthcare professionals. <laughs> It's a very, very interesting question. We, we thought a lot about this because our degree program exists almost since 10 years. So I think next year we have 10 years or something like this. Uh, we, we had a, a bit of a shift from, from structures and processes in healthcare in the beginning where we, we taught a lot of these things about what, how does the healthcare system work and so on and so on. But um, we, we, we somehow found we have to reduce this, um, this in, in favor of technological content and we also saw that the students specifically healthcare people who had no technology uh, in their studies before they liked the content and they always wanted to have more content so we started out with showing people uh, like media technologies how you can distribute how you can record something with a camera do uh, uh, voice uh, uh, bring the voice in distribute this online uh, second thing was actually teaching basic programming in, in web technologies and what we do now is actually we, we teach them some um, um, platform as a service, um, AWS, Microsoft, whatever, take whatever you want. And we actually use this in order to show them how uh, AI works. We, we, we teach uh, students of healthcare a little bit, at least the basics of how AI works and how they could actually uh, classify pictures, for example. Or we, we specifically train them how to do simple things in virtual reality or how server client structures work and how you can program like a database for example this is really um and we can see and what makes us specifically proud is more than 50 percent of our uh, students are women and uh, women from healthcare mainly and these women uh, if if you cast the right people to be in the degree program which we are, uh, fortunately have the chance to then they really take all the content they can get and we, we at the end we have i have like people from healthcare or a woman from healthcare who develop into technical project leads in, 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 in a tech company. And this is really happening in the, uh, whenever the, the tech company gets that they get women from there who really have uh, knowledge in healthcare plus additionally is this uh, tech input. Um, they always come back to me and say, do you have more of these applicants? <laughs> and I say, yes, I'm happy to provide. So uh, this makes us really proud and it's working. This is the, the most important thing here actually. Yes, indeed, and I fully agree with you, uh, Jacob, if I'm allowed to. I think uh, if you start with education, then you are really being able to provide very good quality of, uh, of staff and of uh, people which are really going to, to, to cross the bridge, if we can say that. Yeah. I'm very happy to, to welcome now uh, uh, Ed Janssons, Edwards Janssons. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I never know exactly, so it, I make it probably a bit more English who is uh, coming from Bidzeme University of Applied Sciences from Latvia, and he's the head of the study program Virtual Reality and Smart Technologies. And he is really working very much into how the smart technologies are uh, in different projects and also very active in the UDRES Alliance. So I will kindly ask you, uh, Jensen, Edmund Johnson, I'm sorry for this, uh, to to take the floor and to uh, present your speech. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you for giving me the floor. Um, it's very nice to, that you have um, introduced me to this event, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, so yeah, my name is Edmund Janssons, and um, I'm as a head of the of the master study program for virtual reality. We are very much interested not only in technology, but also in the ways how the technology, the new technology can be used for, for the public good. And um, on the way, well, we are also in, investing our time and efforts uh, for creating these, these new environments. We are also thinking about how and in which ways would the future um, open a different paths to us. And uh, for this reason today, I will introduce you to, to the futures thinking approach as for technology and skills foresight, which is 
uh, something that is somewhat, um, I would say, overshadowed by the giant leaps in technology. Uh, since the foresight and future studies is something that we can usefully use in your uh, daily basis in our professional lives uh, in order to create conditions for better future, not only technology uh, driven future, but also people and person driven future. And this requires for us to have more silence uh, and to be prepared for different changes uh, in both social and technology fields. And uh, this can only be done while investing time and effort in um, defining the futures. So uh, just a brief intro about what we are doing in Bidzum University Virtual Reality Lab. Uh, so as I mentioned, we are creating different environments, which are both driven towards creating new uh, approaches for human-computer interaction, as well as for creating environments where people can learn things where people can uh, train themselves in safe environments without any need for extra effort or extra costs. So this is something that gives us the floor for, for experimenting and um, introducing new approaches. Um, I would just like to, to give you some, some seconds uh, to fill the Mentimeter, uh, as I was kind of advised by Diana that you have the opportunity uh, to answer these two questions. And the first one is about, have you, have you ever heard about strategic foresight and resilience? And the second is whether you have ever deployed futures thinking methods uh, to prepare for unforeseen futures. Uh, it might be that some of the thinking methods, futures thinking methods that you are familiar, you would never tell that they are future thinking methods, um, but we'll get sorted out uh, throughout this uh, this presentation. So I think that um, hopefully you can already give us some some brief uh, responses. Uh, should I proceed, Diana? Um, yes, so we can leave some minutes for the uh, the menti, and then when you want, I can share the result. I think we could uh, look at the answers uh, somewhat later uh, yeah, uh, at the later only, stages. Yes, okay. Okay, okay, good, perfect. You mentioned one, well, and that's okay. Yeah. Until so then, I will continue. ask everybody to answer. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, what is resilience? Um, this is somewhat uh, a question that's uh, rarely quite uh, asked. So, there are some approaches that say that resilience is uh, something that that is a process, uh, an outcome. Uh, of a person adapting uh, to difficult challenges in their life. This is something that uh, American Psychology Association has um, given as a translation for, for this um, question. Um, as far as the European Commission looks at it, uh, resilience is the ability to withstand and cope with different challenges that can happen in the industry. And uh, this can take place in, should take place in a sustainable, fair, and democratic manner. Uh, so there are different ways how we can translate what resilience is, but we can uh, coin this as in fact, a situation where we are prepared for social and technology driven and uh, different other factor impacted futures. That means that we can have uh, different sets of ways and scenarios, how we will, we will uh, create our future. And by create, I mean how we will do things to reach our futures. And this also um, prescribes that we have to think about futures. It's, it's somewhat opposite to the way how we are mostly used to live, to have this moment and to live for this moment. So um, this is very important for personal and for professional uh, life. And when we look at the time dimensions, um, there are different ways how to approach it. So we are in present, there's, of course, the past, the history, uh, all the good and the bad and evil things that have happened, and then we have the future. The way I have foresight and future studies approach these, these time elements is by um, using the best out of every domain uh, of time domains. So it means that the history and the past should never be neglected, whatever the situations have been and how uh, awful or some ways also bloody they have been, they still entail different uh, historical tales and historical patterns that show the human nature and the human behavior. 
And this is something that has an impact on the present and will definitely have an impact on the future. So does the present has an impact on the future. And this is the way how we see uh, those things that we today, that they should be uh, well thought about and the people who are currently um, running or states or, or institutions should always think about the next steps. Uh, future studies also bring here the option for uh, looking into the future. This is by uh, imagining the ways how our present could develop based on the past events. And so while taking these future visions, we can define them into visions that we can choose from, sort of. This means that we should aim for those features that we find the most uh, appropriate that we would actually want to materialize. And um, as we are currently looking at the, the way how the most of our population, our fellow population looks at of the present and the time, mostly it's single view of the future that we are in the present and the future will be the, the happy, good days that we would like to meet. And this is some, somewhat um, illusion that also policymakers uh, like and want to, to follow, is that they try to extrapolate the good trends that we are living in today and to say that they will continue. This is something that we can see in terms of uh, financial markets, um, just as with uh, Meta or as it was called Facebook stocks or Amazon stocks, and all the big, the big tech companies that were having a, a good uh, increased uh, period of boom and people were investing in these stocks with the, continue, with the um, hope of continuous growth. And this is the, the pleasant way how to look at it. So we extrapolate the good trend and hope it will continue. But the future is way more difficult and more complicated. And we can look at this at, the, at it as a range of possible future outcomes. They can be both linear, but most likely they will be nonlinear. And uh, for these reasons, future studies aim at creating these future visions, which are greatly nonlinear, and they can be connected with different loops. So, what the resilient future policy entails? So, foresight projects. Um, um, can give evidence for policymakers to help them create policies that are more resilient to the future. This means that the future studies and foresight gives the conditions for the policymakers to define the best needs of their citizens, of their industries, um, to actually uh, gain the upper hand and to make the future work uh, for them. Um, so the origins of the of the future studies uh, can be traced back to, to um, Middle Ages. So uh, Thomas More's Utopia, um, a, a famous book and famous uh, uh, creation that defines the future society which has overcome the poverty, misery, and which has created the perfect model for living. And uh, this is about idea that the future is one side that it's ideal and this is this, this is the, the bright future that everyone everyone wants to meet but this is uh, of course illusion uh, the illusion how the person's people minds um, want to think but it doesn't take into account that there can be also bad days um, so we can also look at back at uh, Herbert George Wells um, a famous writer who has coined the foresight term, uh, which is which we are now using. And um, so Wells has also been well known for the ways how he foresight different events and foresight different introductions in technology, such as uh, having the first tank fights. Well, this is something that also Leonardo da Vinci uh, invited to his vision. Uh, but one of the most notor notorious things that he, uh, that Wells did uh, was the fact that he predicted the creation of an atomic bomb and he in hand with, with Albert Einstein uh, were the two uh, leading uh, souls of idea of creation of the Manhattan Project, which basically set the stage for uh, United States dominance in the, in the Second World War and post-war uh, period. Um, so to take into account that we can differently look at future studies, we also have to have the proper um, for proper terms, then terminology is very important. 
um, we can see that the forecasting, which mostly is used in public policy, is somewhat quantitative, and so it is dependent on different uh, factors that can um, downgrade the, the level of clarity for the prognosis. Uh, well, the foresight is more futuristic, it's more open, and it's more qualitative methods uh, based. So it means that it has more input uh, variables uh, than the forecasting methods. Um, futures can be different. Futures can be possible futures, which are those futures that can happen, or might say might happen to be more um, precise. And then there are plausible futures, which is a higher um, level of possibility or possibility that the future could happen, and the probable futures, which are basically such futures which we look at something that's going to happen, uh, which is evident by the current trends. Um, and of course, the preferable futures are the ones that we would like to materialize uh, in the end. Um, so just some trend examples of the current day uh, forecasting approach. So everything is somewhat linear. We hope that things will continue in the ways we, we would like to. And we can see here in the inflation outlook uh, from uh, 2021 um, um, that it was forecasted that the inflation this year and for 2023 uh, would be somewhat around 2% till 3%. And uh, as we all know, this is way far off uh, and untrue. And, um, not that I would say that this was uh, this was made by uh, by people who couldn't uh, imagine uh, the, the current day situation, but it was somewhat off from the um, perspective that there's going to be uh, quantitative easing, that there will be uh, more uh, money output than for the previous years, and no one did uh, include the foresight exercise to define such kind of. Um, predictions. So this is the difference. Um, as for the trends, uh, so there's a tendency for people to follow the trends. And uh, there were ending trends in the history, such as Roman Empire, such as Industrial Revolution, dot-com bubble. Um, and these are things that happened and they went away. And, these day, and now we are looking at the new trends, which are XR for work and social activities. Uh, as well as digital wearables, computer assisted communication, personalized health services, and others, which are the trends that would define uh, the near future and the midterm future, so to say. Um, so the future, future studies never end here. And future studies is not, uh, not only about providing the paths, but also about creating uh, futures literacy skills. It's about um, bringing people to understand that futures can be uh, looked into by everyone. And this is something that also uh, UNESCO has acknowledged as something important. So the futures literacy is something for the everyday citizen, also for a person who has never thought about his future in five to 10 years, but he, he should. And this is something that's, that's also uh, encouraged by many. And uh, we can say that this is something as, useful as literacy as such. And being futures literate means that the person is empowered uh, to imagine the future and thus he can create a better future for himself and his fellow citizens. Uh, there are of course different uh, good examples for the futures literacy. What can it bring about? And uh, some of them is uh, leadership as an outcome, uh, innovation skills and strategy, um, as well as others, and of course, resilience, as we uh, previously discussed. And I would just like to um, underline that the futures literacy is something for everyone. And um, this is something that we are currently also developing in terms of our curriculum and what we are going to work on on the next years as well. Um, also, we have to take into account the futures is something that is not predetermined. We can tailor future. We cannot make it, but we can tailor as far as our human uh, skills can, can help us. Uh, but it, it means that we can be involved in bigger processes than, we, than ourselves. So it means that everyone counts and everyone can, can help to bring the better future to materialize. So 
future studies is not about just predicting the probability, it's about creating the possibility and creating the preferable futures by giving the conditions for it to happen. And um, this is something that, that's uh, currently uh, used also by different research groups, and they do use the STEEP, the social, technological, uh, economic, environmental, and policy approach. So it means that all of these categories have to be taken into account uh, when defining the futures. So the future um, is always uh, multilateral, multi uh, multi level, so to say. And um, a study of the future means that we have to think of different options and different ways how it can entail. Uh, there are, of course, different futures methodologies that can be used. Uh, so to name some of them as backcasting, uh, Delphi methods, uh, and uh, horizon scanning. Horizon scanning is something that's used uh, very often for technology foresight, uh, just to define the upcoming trends and to be prepared for them. Um, so there are different ways how to, how to study the futures, and um, these are just some of the methods. Uh, there are, of course, plenty of more, and um, they can all be used whether um, uh, in mixed groups or, or they can be used on standalone basis. But nonetheless, uh, there are way more methods that, that, that we already use daily as, for example, SWOT analysis is something that is a sub supplementary method for future studies. Uh, but still, it's, it's commonly used and uh, it's one of the rare periods of time that we have exercised futures uh, when we were students, uh, because I think the SWOT analysis is something that every student has to do in Europe. <laughs> this is an impression that, that has arisen. Uh, <clears throat> but for futures, uh, there are also some factors that have to be taken into account, and uh, uh, some of them are the weak signals, which are basically the indicators of emerging issues. Uh, then we have trends, which are, as we discussed before, something that has given uh, us the, the trend line, uh, the mainstream future, but still they should be used, but with a pinch of salt, that's for, uh, that's for necessary. Megatrends, uh, the long-term phenomena that uh, can change slowly, uh, but that happens in the long-term and it brings about very impactful changes. So we can say that um, metaverse is one of those trends that happen uh, which will bring about a great social change in 20 years or even fewer years, but it will happen. Uh, wild cards and black swans. So wild cards, some incidents that can that has low probability of taking place, but the, when they would happen, uh, they can have a, a high impact on the society and on the industry. And finally, the black swans, uh, the happenings which are very improbable, but when they happen, they happen with high impact. And uh, we could say that that COVID-19 was one of those black swans, swans that no one expected, uh, but what brought for all the society in the whole world, a uh, very high impacted uh, event that took place for the last two years. Um, so in terms of, of defining futures, there are different schemes and approaches, and this is just one of the most uh, simple ones, uh, how we can uh, look at the possibilities of the future. Uh, we can say that we can question where we are now and how can it entail. Uh, then there's a question who we are and what we want to be. And this can be questioned both by individual as well as by the industry, by, by um, uh, institution, by industry, even by a state. And this is some things that, that countries do. They question where they want to lead their citizens and how can they get there. And all, on their way, they have strategies and action programs which are uh, fruitful and they bring about change. Um, so by the outcomes of future studies, we can have future scenarios, future images, and future visions. So um, scenarios give us the glimpse of the ways how different futures can entail. The images are the ones that uh, that we look at something that is the end result and the future visions, the description of our desired vision of the future, how we would like to have it. And finally, so almost finally about technology foresight and uh, technology skill foresight. These are the two 
the most useful terms for um, for technology and uh, STEM field, which is basically um, a tool, an approach used for technology development process, also for industry development, and uh, skills foresight, which basically covers the field of exploration and development of future-proofed policies for giving the citizens the skills that will be needed in the near future. And the question and the interrelation between technology and skills is quite um, clear in the terms that we have to indicate uh, the need for certain skills that can be applied for the technology. And these days we have technologies, uh, technology that uh, that is new to us and that we still try to define what kind of skills should it should we need the people to give. And skills technology foresight is something that can anticipate the needed skills for the future, which is something that uh, can compare the current skill set of population and that what we would like them to have in the future. It can help seek um, to cover the, the gaps in the education system and it's something that is way more flexible compared to the quantitative approach that has been used for the, for the most uh, time uh, for uh, uh, education sector. And it's less prone to the changes in the industry and the changes in technologies. So it gives more effective results uh, in terms of, of end result. Um, this is about a um, change management tool uh, for, the, for the skill uh, technology foresight, which uh, starts by defining the trends, the, the policies, and then goes further for the task and skill demands. Uh, as for an example, we can say that our XR industry that we are currently working on uh, is somewhat under uh, the scope of these kind of uh, exercises. And we can say that just the simplest way is to define what kind of solutions uh, will the metaverse need and what will it bring about then we can define what the social interaction realities will look like in the XR. And further on, we can, uh, we can look at what sort of skills uh, will the extended reality uh, require from the citizens and then this needed skill set can be, can be addressed uh, by the professionals in say 10 years, 15 years, et cetera. And the open question is what skills would the industry four or five actually require uh, in the upcoming years, and um, it's still to be in, in, in invested timing. We have to uh, we have to define that people are doing that, but this is clear that the question of the future and the future skills is open, and it's still open for for researchers uh, to do their researches on, as the so society will change with the with the industry and with the technology. So this is something that has to be taken into account. And actually, this is something that we are currently also doing is we have uh, three uh, digitalization projects uh, uh, covered by, um, ER, uh, by European Social Fund, which is aimed at um, increasing the digital skill set of our citizens, of our students, uh, most um, specifically for the Digicom skill set. So we'll try to define the needs of, this, of this, uh, students uh, in their near future and midterm future. Uh, to hopefully bring them you know, to their best positions in the, in the job market. Um, and finally, some of the success factors for the foresight, uh, we can hope for good uh, foresight result um, only when we would have meaningful, or we would have a foresight culture that is aimed at creating, producing meaningful results. Uh, that is about initiating response to the results and about informing citizens and society about uh, the usefulness of foresight thinking. And by this, um, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I still have one quiz question uh, for the question of resilience. Hopefully you, you're, yeah. you will be able to answer. Thank you. Not yet. Uh, apologies for I stopped your uh, screen share because we don't uh, we don't show yet the quiz question. Uh, let's uh, share the menti question first, and for you to comment on the menti question first. So your question was: What have you heard 
about uh, strategic foresight and resilience, and we have deployed future thinking methods to prepare for unseen futures. Um, and I kindly ask you uh, to comment on this. All right, so we can see that, uh, that the terminology is somewhat, for some, it's uh, quite well known. Some has, has heard about it. Would, it seems like 50-50 to me. That some have no experience and some have some, some more detailed experience. Um, so using future thinking scenarios for development of entrepreneurship and innovation skills of students. So this is very nice. I see that that um, the skill set is used for, for good use. They use forecasting methods with our students and for design sprints. So um, for design thinking, futures uh, forecast, futures methods are very good. Uh, the, the question is why, whether by forecasting, uh, they are thinking of uh, trend analysis, hopefully not. <laughs> Okay, so we have quite interesting uh, answers, but also some yes. which uh, clearly show, in my opinion, that the topic is very new for, for quite some. I will kindly ask also uh, in this moment, uh, Jacob to join us if it's possible. And um, perfect, thank you so much. And as far as you see, uh, we have had a very interesting and uh, challenging uh, discussion. I don't see any questions. Oh, I see one question. So, uh, Jensen, one question for you. Is it important when we think about defining our professional future to relate to what others say and do? Hmm. Well, this is um, the good old question. Should we uh, make happy everyone? And I would say that we can never make everyone happy and we, would, we, we should aim for um, feel for reaching the thing that we, we, we hope is the best for us. So we should aim for the future that we think will bring the benefit to us. And if we look at the industry or skill set that we, we fully uh, believe will be needed in the, the next five to 10 years, then I would say that in, in five years, the person who was unhappy with you as a person of choosing this kind of uh, skill set he would say that you should have definitely learned this skill. Why didn't you do that five years ago? So um, I would say that this is more about uh, personal choices rather than social choices. Um, choosing your skill set is about your personal choice. Indeed, indeed, if I can say that. And I think uh, this is quite, uh, quite an interesting uh, perspective because this will show us, uh, in fact, exactly how you can, uh, you can really do. And we have been uh, discussing from digital health uh, to future casting today. And uh, I need to say that uh, as a general view, I will clearly want to see some, uh, some methods, especially, for example, the wild card method, which I quite know and apply sometimes, apply to the digital healthcare systems in, in several countries. So, uh, that's not a joke, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, it will be quite interesting to see a cooperation between these two uh, research groups uh, in our UDRAS areas, even if they seem so far away, I still think uh, there is a common ground somewhere. If you will, uh, if you want to comment, uh, uh, Jacob or Edmund, anything, please. Mike. Um, on potential uh, corporations, yeah. Um, 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 so we, we are always searching out to to other fields. I think this is pretty important, actually, in, in at least what concerns my work. So I have around, I don't know, 15 to 20 years of work experience. Um, um, I, I worked with fashion designers. I worked with, uh, with industry sensor producers. I worked with architects. I worked with... Uh, media designers I, I worked with uh, uh, people who build elevators uh, I have so many different kind of and, and in each of these scenarios I basically learned quite a lot and now I'm applying this to healthcare and uh, healthcare per se is like a field that is interdisciplinary when you take all of the professions that are needed actually to, to drive it so 
uh, if you want my my raised hand for for interprofessional collaborations and for the disciplinary collaborations yeah all the way through do it do it this is my really number one uh, advice that i would give because you always learn so my, my my main motto is even when i start with the students each year i tell them that everyone is a student and everyone is a teacher so uh we learn from each other and also we learn from the students each each other day so that's that should be quite common actually <laughs> Good. Until uh, we answer the next question, which we have, which is a combined question, I think, uh, for both of you. Um, for our participants and attendees, you know the rule. We have a quiz now, which I'm launching in this moment. And please answer to this quiz. Uh, there are two questions. One has only a single answer correct. The other one has two answers correctly. Please answer to these questions, the attendees. And while we are answering to these questions and uh, you are doing this, I will ask the next question, which has popped in from Anka Dragic, uh, quite a good professor from our uh, university, which is cyber like future products of digital health. What do you think about this? So um, I think this, this can go to both of you, in fact. Uh, well, uh, if I may have the floor, so um, I would say that that uh, there is a link. Um, uh, the, the current trend is that we are heading towards uh, the platformization of humans, meaning that there's a, a trend is towards becoming cyborgs, uh, as whether we want it or not. Uh, the technology is going to, to drive us further and further away from, from our natural selves. Uh, this is something that um, I would say that will happen due to the social pressure, meaning that the person who is more capable whilst using technology, uh, he will bring more people with him. So it means that once you have the early adopters and then you have later stage adopters, then those who are the laggers, uh, they, will, they will have no other option but to, to opt for the technology. Otherwise, they will be left outside of the, uh, the competencies that are needed for uh, successful career or possibly life. Uh, this is something that we can see also in current day uh, China uh, when they have the social credit system, which is which affects the way how society runs, meaning that those who are opting out, uh, they're also opting out from, from different benefits that the society uh, uh, can use on their everyday basis. I know this is something, some example that that is more harsh, but uh, this is this is also some way similar to the way how uh, how digital technologies and uh, different implants will uh, become part of our of our human kind, so to say. Jacob, if you want to answer also to this one, please. Yeah, I like the the the, the vision or the 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 hypothesis or quite a quite a lot basically because i i think think uh, mr uh um Janssen is is right so that we have this this media extension that our body where started out with, with i don't know was it chomsky or whoever was it uh, who said that that everything's a media extension and message uh, media is the message and stuff like this um definitely we are moving full-fledged into technology but on the other hand um we can also see that and, and this basically is a challenge to meaning what, that we need to redefine what 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 humans are i mean given that all this uh, automatically answer machines like chat gdp like uh, images uh, and and art that is produced by by artificial intelligence uh, but on the other hand we have like if you look at society what is happening so uh, there's a counter trend where people actually really care about um what is happening to the to the human body or human identity so non-binary gender is on the one thing uh and you could also say uh like like uh, you had it currently in the us that uh, abortion laws are uh, cutting back so people really get angry about this they want to define and still have something that is human so this will be a very interesting societal discussion and we need a lot of people to participate in this, not only uh, lawmakers or technologists. So uh, you can see what's going wrong with if only technologists actually do things you can right now see in real time on Twitter with Elon Musk, who is completely turning, uh, in my opinion, crazy in, in some kind of sense, uh, uh, listening to fake news and uh, posting things about, uh, uh, I don't know, stereotypes and stuff like this. So this is not how we want it to be. But 
um, we, we need people to be aware and participate and also uh, cut technologies out of some parts of our life, like um, whatever we want to achieve as a, as a person for ourselves. Uh, yeah, this is my opinion, <laughs> personally. Yes, yes. I, I fully agree with you. Just give me one second. I want to remind our participants to answer the questions in the quiz because only 29 have answered. And we have almost 70 in, uh, in the room. So please answer the question in the quiz. I need to remind you, if you don't answer the question in the quiz, you will not receive the digital badge participation of this, uh, of this uh, open lecture. So please answer the question in the quiz. You, you Please, can see can the, 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 the technological um, uh, pressure mounting up even, even in here, actually. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Social indeed. credit badges. Please. <laughs> yes. Please, Jensen, please. Um, yes, um, thank you. Uh, the, the one thing I wanted to add is that, that we are lo looking at a technology-driven society that's, that's going to emerge, and it's already emerging. And um, technology, the pace of development of technology is way faster than development of uh, digital ethics. And this is something that, well, I would say it's overseen currently and, and we, we can happen uh, to become in a, uh, to get in a situation where technology is everywhere and there's no privacy anymore. Uh, even the, the, the last drops of privacy that we still have <laughs> these days. So it means that the digital ethics and the way how we have um, how we uh, bring about the, the useful use of technology without compromising our so our, uh, our personal life is something that that still isn't looked into as as as, as uh, in the whole scope as it should be. So I would say that uh, also in our sphere, in virtual reality and extended reality uh, domain. Uh, the question of, of the digital ethics is something new to us and we are still exploring how, how it should be and how it should work in the future. I fully agree and I think that everyone should uh, participate uh, in this discussion. So it, it's not only for academics or only happening in, 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 uh, in the universities and stuff like this. This needs every, everyone uh, in, in our society to participate and have, have a meaning on, on this, what this ethics or digital ethics e even is. I mean, um, in what kind of society do we want to live now and in the future? This is uh, the, basically the, the question. Yes, and I, I totally agree that, in fact, uh, the discussion about ethics and uh, building up digital competencies and digital skills and media skills is uh, our due, uh, our university and the education system, because if we don't do it, and if we don't do it, not necessarily only with our students, but also publicly for our community and our regions, then who else? And, uh, and we need to be more open and more clear about that. I just had very recently a discussion about this with some, with some colleagues in a very informal uh, manner in, in uh, you know, how to say, at a restaurant, and they were, completely arguing something which I proved to them that is wrong. <laughs> and uh, they they become a bit strange because uh, it's not easy to, to understand and to believe that you can be that wrong and get it so wrong uh, because you don't, don't check fully all the facts and you just rely on a source of information, even if sometimes that's quite a reliable one, because in this case was a article published by, by a newspaper, which is not, not uh, how to say, one which you will dismiss that quickly. But everybody can make a mistake. Um, in Romania was quite a famous one um, during the Halloween. This is uh, me losing a bit of time until I'm still waiting for people to answer the quiz. Uh, is that, for example, uh, they, because you mentioned Elon, Elon Musk, during the Halloween, somebody launched uh, on, on Facebook a trend that Elon Musk is uh, in the Halloweens at the Dracula Castle in Transylvania. And believe it or not, all the national television and the major newspapers, without fact checking, they made the news out of this, that Elon Musk is in Romania and they were going frenzy, trying to catch him where he is and with what plane he arrived and so on. And, and another important act, Hollywood act, actor had a party then 
and they until they managed to realize that it's not him and he was not there it was two days and all the major televisions were a big laugh of quite a lot of the people but this is how quickly uh fake news can spread if you don't fact fact checks and, and it's our job i think uh, to do that as more seriously as possible okay so time's up i have all the patients in the world now so let's see the results at this moment of the quiz. So this is good because the first question, what approach does it need to be to innovate in the field of digital healthcare for patients and healthcare staff? The correct answer was transdisciplinary research and development towards applied research, focusing on the needs and benefits of patients and healthcare staff with an open innovation approach, sharing knowledge across borders. That was correct. The second one was more tricky. So resilience mainly is ability to dream, conditions for ima imagining futures, personal or institutional readiness for the unknown, and preparedness to act in response to external challenges. The last two questions are the correct ones. So we only had about 56 to 76 percent correct answers to to this one, so this uh, has shown that it's a bit more tricky. I need, uh, I will I just share now the results so you are able also to, to show and to see all of these results by yourself. If you are still in Zoom, we still have quite, almost everybody in Zoom. So you are able to see if you answer correctly or not to your answer, to your, um, uh, how to say, to your question. And uh, this can be quite interesting. And I will kindly ask uh, um, my two guests from today to, to give their final remarks and to close the session in the next two minutes. Uh, let's start with uh, Professor Edmund Jensen. The closing remark, if you have one. Well, thank you everyone for spending this, 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 this almost an hour with us. Uh, even more. Um, thank you for, for uh, showing your interest. I hope that the topic that, that I covered in terms of future studies is something that you can and uh, could relate to in the future. Uh, everyone is very welcome to address me. Uh, if in terms you, you find it interesting to um, collaborate in terms of future studies or in terms of virtual and augmented reality, as this is something that we are uh, these days working on. And, hope to have more uh, people joining us. So um, thank you and hope you will have a prepared and resilient future. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Jacob Doppler, please. Yes, uh, thank you so much for for having me, and uh, I really believe in this in this uh, interdisciplinary trans uh, cross border um, cooperation, be it in in, in uh, teaching or be it in, in research. Uh, and and of course this um, like initiatives like like Eins uh, or our univers uh, European University UDRAS uh, help help a lot in these endeavors. It it always takes time to actually understand each other. This is something that that I also learned. Um, so so take your time to understand the positions uh, over disciplines, over over institutions, over over uh, country borders, and we will have a, a very good European um, future coming. Um, I'm, I'm actually a little bit, this is like a political side note since so many from, from Romania are here. So uh, I, I, I follow politics a lot. And, and within the last days, actually, uh, one really stupid Austrian politician, I, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, uh, he uh, like mo almost single handedly canceled uh, like the Schengen uh, 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 border, uh, cross border cooperation to Romania. Um, uh, pursue your goals even further. You, you'll be part of this Schengen uh, soon. This is just a, a, a one more time, a kind of a nationalistic uh, agenda that doesn't get us anywhere. And and uh, again, I, I have a junior researcher now from Romania incoming. We had visits uh, in, in Timisoara, I think a group of uh, St. Pelton uh, from Austria. We had people from uh, from Romania here. So super happy to collaborate in the future and, and see you again in any of these uh, kind of events. Thank you very much. Yes, you are right. Um, and we cooperate with the uh, of St. Paul for more than 20 years. I was there when your uh, campus was open, 25 years, 20 years ago. So 
quite a long time. And the same, we are very happy to cooperate now with the Bitterme University from Latvia. And I think the UDRAS has had very interesting partnership now, very different in some respect, but still very close. And I really see a future. And I need to say we became quite good friends with several of them, even in a short period of time. I need to say also thank you very much to the participants and also to the speakers for their time and for their knowledge, which they very happily shared today. Uh, thank you very much for all the participants who attended the fifth uh, open lecture series of the ICE uh, UDRAS uh, project. We are going coming back after the holidays. So in January, we will still come back with the open lecture series. And we will inform you in time about uh, very interesting two and more topics which we have prepared uh, for you. Thank you very much. Happy holidays. Enjoy your time with your family and friends wherever you are. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.